would, turn to Numbers chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to read the first three verses of ch Numbers chapter 1 and the first two verses of Numbers chapter 2. <coughs> Excuse me. Numbers chapter 1 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation, on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel, after their families, by the house of their fathers, with the number of their names, every male by their poles. From twenty years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel. Thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. And then Numbers chapter 2, verse 1, And Aaron and the Lord spoke, spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house, far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. Okay. This is the start of the fourth book of the Pentateuch, the book of Numbers. In Genesis we see the history leading up to the establishment of Israel. Types of Christ abound in Genesis. We see the unfolding of God's work, God's will, God's purpose, God's pleasure and election from the creation to Adam and Eve in the garden to Abel who offered the proper sacrifice, to Enoch walking with God until God took him, to Noah and God's ark, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob who is named Israel. To Joseph saving his family, we see the election and the choice of God and the deliverance we see in Exodus, the Passover, the blood sacrifice and the deliverance from bondage in Egypt. In Leviticus, you'll see priestly worship and communion with God through the sacrifices and the offerings. We'll see those established in Leviticus. You'll see the priesthood established. You'll see the high priesthood established. Now we come to Numbers in the fourth book and what we start off with here is the beginning throughout this book you will see the congregations walk and warfare this is all a progressive thing as the Lord leads us through these these books it's there's nothing haphazard about the scripture there's a lot haphazard with our understanding of the scripture but there's nothing haphazard with the way God has actually laid it out in this book for us. In chapter 1 of Numbers, guess what we see? We see the congregation of Israel being numbered. I wonder where they got the title from the book for. We see them numbered. We see the numbering of all the congregation and we see it in preparation for the assembling in chapter 2. The world, this world, is not a hospitable place for the child of God. It never has been since the garden. Now God has provided and made the way for his people and he always has and he always will. God has promised us, promised a place for his people and God has promised and provided the way for his people. And we are also being prepared 
for what is coming ahead. Now in these two chapters, mostly in this first chapter, the first three verses, I've got four different things written down. I'm going to use your list, Walter. Number one, we are commanded to be assembled. To be counted and to be assembled. Number two, we are told how to assemble. Number three, we are told who is to assemble. And number four, we are told for what purpose we do assemble. So the first one is that we are commanded to assemble. This is not a request. This is not a, a question of what's the best practice. This is a command from the Lord where he says, And the Lord spake to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tabernacle on the first day of the second month in the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt. It's tough to get more specific than that. It's on the first day of the second month of the second year that you're here. God said this. God meant this. There is a time for every purpose under the heaven. And the time for this numbering, the time for this assembling is after the Passover after being brought out of Egypt after crossing the Red Sea after the tabernacles built and the offerings are given and are being made then the Lord says take the sum of the congregation of the children of Israel as I said nothing's done by accident nothing's done haphazardly this is the order and God has commanded it to be done. Now, after this numbering is complete, you will see, that's why I read verse chapter, uh, chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2, where it says, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house. It's a command. He said, number the children of Israel. Number all of the congregation. Then he specifies it on down. This is what we are to do. We are to assemble ourselves together. Not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. It's the way it puts it in the New Testament. As the manner of some is. Some do. They're not supposed to. They shouldn't. We are to gather together. We are his family. And that's what it starts talking about in the second part. How we assemble. How do we assemble? It tells us. Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel after their families by the house of their fathers our God our God the Lord God of the Bible is the father of his family this is the example he's given us this is what he calls us we are called as believers we are called his children, the sons and daughters of God. He has made that relationship with us. And we have that relationship that he has made with him through his son, our elder brother who's not ashamed to call us brethren. This book is a book about the family of God. You'll see it from here, generations to revolutions, from Genesis to Revelation and every book in between. It's always about family. 
I remember when Walter first pointed that out and hit it, stressed it. It it stuck in my head finally. Earl had talked about it, but I don't know that it stuck so well in there. But when Walter did that time, it's, and, it, and I still, every time I open this book, wherever I'm looking, you'll see we, you'll see us. They don't talk about them. There are those outside the family. Because if there is a family unit, there's somebody outside the family. It's not all everybody in the world. It's not. He's talking about the congregation of Israel here. And they are to gather together, what, to be numbered, and then to pitch their tents together by the family. By the family. And we are to gather together in our local assembly and we are family. You are my brothers and sisters in Christ. I am your brother in Christ. We are together and we are to stay together. We are to be together. And this is where we are to pitch our tent. Because this is where the Lord has put us. But here we're talking about the whole congregation. And it does go into it in great detail. I'm not going to get into it. There's 12 tribes. Three tribes to a quadrant. You have some pitched in the north. In the, well, in the north. In the south. In the east. In the west. That's the four quadrants. Three families each. In the center of these four quadrants, north, south, east, and west, is the tabernacle. The tabernacle is always in the center. And this is how we are to assemble. We are to assemble by family, but all the families, all the families of the children of God, all the families of the congregation of Israel, no matter where they are, north, south, east, or west, in the center is the tabernacle. And he goes on to say it in verse, in, I think, chapter 5. He says, Whereof I dwell in the midst. In the center of the assembly is God. And if that's not the center of your, for your assembly, you're not an assembly. You're not part of the family. If God's not the center, it's not the family. We have around us other places that we know about, some we don't. I'm sure. We know of Rocky Mount, we know of Fairmont, we know of Pikeville. There's, they're all around. We're going to have a fellow here in June from New Jersey, I think, isn't it? Who knew the gospel was in New Jersey? God does. But in the center, all these assemblies, we are related to. But we gather by our family here. They gather by their family there. But in the center is to be the sun. In the center is the tabernacle. In the center is the mercy seat. In the center is where the blood is applied, where the blood was shed. That's how we assemble. Because the tabernacle and the God of the tabernacle is the center of the assembly of the congregation. Wherever you are, it doesn't matter. The Lord is in the midst thereof. Christ said it, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I. He's already there. In the midst of them. He's already there. It doesn't say there I am. No, there am I. If you're gathering together two or three in his name, he's the one that brought you there. He's there already. 
the third thing who was to assemble well he told us all the congregation of Israel we want the sum of all the congregation of Israel then in verse 2 he specifies every male from 20 years and up now I am not going to exclude women from the sermon okay this example and that's what these things are it's for for our example this example is using an example of men in battle men preparing for war and in these days it was just men our assembly is man woman and child but here it's a specific thing that he's trying to, to point out I think here for us because this is the reality is actual warfare real war so it's adult males that was the example what we're looking at here is I believe a gathering and it's talking about a gathering of adults this gathering for war to go forth to war is not a thing for babes children and the infirm that's who is to assemble in this case we're told able-bodied men that's the way they used to say it during the war World War II and all men were the ones who went to war this is the example the assembly is made up of full age adult sons but then he qualifies it even more all that are able Here's the qualification. Are you able? Now, it doesn't ask how able you are. Just are you able? Every male of 20 years of age and up who is able. Now, I do want to point out there is a specific notable exception here to this numbering and to where this this pitching around in the quadrants for the to go forth to war there's one notable exception and if you would just take a look at it for a minute here in numbers chapter 1 and verse 49 only thou shalt number shalt not number excuse me the tribe of Levi neither take the sum of them among the children of Israel now there are 12 tribes and I look through it I'm not gonna like I said I'm not gonna go into it Levi's left out of this numbering but Joseph he split it into two you have Ephraim and Manasseh as two tribes so that way you keep the number 12 around it and you have the Levites and it tells us but thou shall appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony and over all the vessels thereof and over all the things that belong to it they shall bear the tabernacle and all the vessels thereof and they shall minister unto it and shall encamp round about the tabernacle so in that center where the tabernacle is around that tabernacle is the tribe of Levi is the tribe of the priests and the tribe of the high priest that's the center of the assembly the center of the assembly of the people of God in this case here is the place of worship the place of communion with God there is no assembly without the worship of God there's not 
That's always there. That's the notable exception of who is to assemble. All that are able. The Levites had a job. Service to the tabernacle. Everyone else was numbered in the assembly. Fourthly, for what purpose is the assembly? To go forth. Simply put, to go forth. That's what it says. From 20 years old and upward, all that are able, what? To go forth to war in Israel. That's the purpose of this assembly, of this numbering, and of this gathering, of this pitching of tents. By family. The assembly is to be ready, and it is to go forth. That sounds awfully simple. But I do want to notice... very carefully that we don't have any going forth until they are assembled. We are to walk as an assembly. Now we do walk alone. We walk on our own. We are all to walk. But there is a walk assembled. One time the congregation was told to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Well they did. They stood still and they saw the salvation of the Lord. But then after that it says what? Go forth. The assembly, the assembly is not to stand still forever. It's not to remain standing. There is a walk for the sons and daughters of God. Paul's epistle is full of this. And you see it as individuals, but you also see it as groups. Paul writes it this way. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We are to walk in the light. We are to walk in the light. As He is the light. And so not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We are to walk in the steps of faith. Let us walk in newness of life. We are those who we are those who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. We are to walk honestly. Colossians 1 and 10 says that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. That's Colossians 2 and verse 6. As ye have received, so walk. 1 Thessalonians 2 and 12 says that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Now those are just some of the passages about walk. And that's just from the epistles of Paul. It's not, the God, it's not from the Gospels. It's not from anything else. That's just from the epistles of Paul. Our Lord Jesus Christ told us that if ye continue, then you will be my disciples indeed. We are to go forth. And it does say to war. 
warfare. There are battles to fight. As we go forth, there are battles to fight. Let me look. Second Corinthians chapter ten. I gotta read this. Now I, Paul, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in the presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, what? We do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having a readiness, a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trust to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that does what? Exalts itself against the knowledge of God. This is where our warfare lies. And this is where our weapons are, the Word of God. He goes into it in Ephesians chapter 6. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly, not worldly, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And it says in Ephesians 6, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But before that he said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's verse 10. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. This is what this assembly is to go forth to. Our, our warfare is not carnal. Our weapons are not carnal. But we are to go forth and speak the truth of God as it is to men as they are to ourselves as we are and we are to go forth from this example in number one we are the assembly is to move forward go forward now if you look at this in numbers I'm not going to go into it again but it numbers them, the rest of chapter 1, it numbers them all by tribe. And if you add it up, it comes to exactly 603,550 men, 20 years of old and up, that are able to go forth to war. And it tells you that in chapter 2. And I added it up with a calculator, and it comes up exactly the same. How specific is the Lord. 603,550 men, 20 years of up, able to go forth to war. What's it say in the beginning of Numbers chapter 1? It says, take the sum. And I thought about it and I thought, even mathematics serves God. 
How specific now is the Lord about those he chose from before the foundation of the world? Christ said, every hair on your head is numbered. And you are worth more than many sparrows. Our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. And he has been pleased to tell us we are to assemble and to go forth as an assembly. We do go individually, but we are also to go forth as an assembly to the battle. He has ordained us that we should walk in good works. This is a good work. Going forth unto war is a good work. Because there is a warfare. There are battles to fight. But never forget, it's his battle. The battle is the Lord's. We personally may seem to lose. We actually may lose as far as we're concerned from our point of view. I made a comment on the way up here on something the guy said on the radio. He was talking about David not perceiving or not having evil against him or not perceiving evil I can't remember exactly what it was but what the scripture actually stated was the fact that evil was not going to overcome David it didn't say that he wasn't going to have evil days it didn't say that there weren't going to be bad things it didn't say that we might from our perspective, seem to lose a battle, seem to lose a fight, take casualties. But God always perseveres. And the battle is the Lord's. He shall win the day. All things do work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. They always have and they always will. Why? Because everything the Lord does is good, is right, whether we know it or not. Especially when we don't know it. But it all starts with this gathering this assembling and this assembling around the Lord and we go forth after this assembly because we never ever walk alone we walk with each other but more importantly when it came time for Israel to move to go forth to war that was the job of the Levites. They took the tabernacle apart and went with them. Our God has always promised to be with us. I will never leave you and never forsake you. And the deeper meaning of that is that I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. He leads us and He guides us even when we don't feel it or know it. So what can you say? Have faith and go forth. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this time and this place. Thank you for your Son, our Lord. Thank you for this assembly where we can gather together in fellowship and in love to try to worship you in spirit and in truth 
and to try, Lord, try to hold forth your word about your Son, the one who gave himself for us. In Christ's name we ask and we pray. Amen.